So it's uh, pretty terrifying to speak to this room. I've spoken to a lot of audiences, but not a group of journalists or people studying to be journalists. So I'm going to start with a short video. And being now some new information and disturbing information just into us. The New York Times now says that four of its journalists reporting on the conflict in Libya have gone missing. Four journalists, two reporters and two photographers for the New York Times disappeared on Tuesday. Editors say they have not heard from Anthony Shadid, Stephen Farrell, Tyler Hicks and Lindsay Adario. Four New York Times journalists were held captive. They'd been reporting from the eastern city of Ajabia. The Times executive editor says the paper has been in contact with the Libyan government and they were assured that the four would be released promptly if they had been captured. Libyan authorities said the group was captured in eastern Libya last week by forces loyal to Colonel Gaddafi. The message I would give is that they were reporting the conflict there, but then unbiased. They were covering hospitals, the front line, everything, and obviously, you know, it's, it's tough. It's tough to now, you know, to sit here and, and, and not know, you know, what has happened. So uh, the question that I get most often is, why do I do this work? And how did I start doing this work? And I thought I would start with my childhood. So I grew up in Connecticut in, uh, in the very nice town of Westport. And I was the youngest of four sisters. And I think for me, that was probably the best training to cover war, was getting beaten up by my three <laughs> sisters every day of my life. <laughs> and there I am <laughs> in the lower right, <laughs> very 70s. So uh, in the 90s, I was working in New York City for the Associated Press, and I was sort of on call with a pager and a cell phone for every day for about four years. And in 2000, I decided to move to India. And I had always wanted to cover uh, stories overseas, but I wasn't sure how I could do that. I was making trips to Cuba uh, every year from 1997. Uh, but in 2000, I thought, OK, it's time to move overseas. So I moved to India. And I had sent a bunch of emails saying, do you need a freelancer to a bunch of newspapers? And the Boston Globe actually gave me one of my first strings. And so I moved there, and I was renting a room from the Dow Jones bureau chief, and I had absolutely no money. And he was going in and out of Afghanistan under the Taliban. And he came back from a trip, and he said, you know, you're a woman, and you care about women's issues. And why don't you work in Afghanistan and cover women's stories under the Taliban? And I thought, oh, that's a great idea. OK, yeah, you're absolutely right. I'd never worked in a war zone. Um, you know, it didn't, really, it didn't really give me pause that there was no American embassy, that women, unaccompanied women, couldn't travel around alone, that photography was illegal of any living thing. And so I just called my sister, Lisa, and I said, Lee, can I borrow a few thousand dollars to go to Afghanistan? And she was like, OK. So she sent me the money. And uh, no one knew what Afghanistan was, of course, as before September 11th. And my family, we were hairdressers. So of course, no one was reading the New York Times at that point. And so then I called my mom. And I said, Mom, I'm going to go to Afghanistan tomorrow. And she said, OK, honey, have fun. <laughs> and so I went. <laughs> and uh, so these are some of the first pictures I made. Uh, I had the UNHCR was still on the ground there. And they took me around. And so I'd have to sneak these pictures either out the car window um, but I learned quickly that my gender was a big asset because I had access to women at home. And um, so I would go into women's homes. And surprisingly, at that point, because there was no media, uh, there was no access to TV or newspapers or anything, um, people weren't scared to have their picture taken because they knew that the picture wouldn't actually make it back into the country. So I was photographing secret girls schools under the Taliban. There were very brave families who opened their homes and had schools there. And secret weddings. This is I was at um, covering the drought in Herat in, two, in March of 2001. And my driver said, Madam, I have to go. There's a wedding. And I said, well, take me. And so he took me down into this basement. And they were playing the Titanic and dancing around, which was shocking. And then I started working in the women's hospitals. And when I went, this is what the, the hospital uh, looked like under the Taliban. There was almost no medicine. Uh, this is a woman in labor. This is in 2000. And I went back after September 11th. I asked uh, the New York Times if I could go cover the fall of the Taliban. And I went to Kandahar and waited for the fall of the Taliban in Quetta and traveled into Kandahar and was there um, when they first played music on the streets in Kandahar. And, and really, there was this 
Kandahar was terrifying for me because I had never been in that sort of situation where I drove in directly after the fall of a regime, and I didn't really know what to expect. So I sort of, I remember being with Ruth Fremson, who's a New York Times photographer in the back seat, and I was working for the magazine, and she was working for the paper. And I, we drove into the governor's mansion, and there were all of these men, like these men, sort of staring into the car window. And I thought that they would eat us. Like, literally, they were looking at us like we were a kebab. And literally, I looked at Ruth, and I was like, do we have to get out of the car? And she's like, yes, you need to get out of the car. <laughs> and I was terrified, and so we went out. And so it was really, at that point in my career, I was really looking to elders and people who had experience to sort of teach me how to photograph, because I didn't really know. And in 2003, it was clear we were going to, the, going to war in Iraq. And I was offered an embed position with the 101st Airborne. And I didn't take it because I didn't know if I'd be able to handle it. I didn't know if I would be too scared and what happened if we faced combat and could I, could I handle myself. So I ended up going into northern Iraq. Uh, I traveled through Iran into northern Iraq because we thought there might be a humanitarian crisis there and that refugees would come from the south into the north. So I went into northern Iraq, and immediately there was a proxy war going on with El Ansar, which was linked to Al Qaeda and the mountains around. And so we ended up covering that. And then about six weeks later, Saddam Hussein fell, and we traveled down to Kirkuk and covered this initial sort of amazing euphoria after the fall of Saddam. And people were looking at his palaces and touring around and swimming in the, in the man-made lakes that he had created around his palaces because Iraqis had never had access to these scenes. Of course, Saddam had diverted the water in the country for his own personal use. Iraqis often didn't have water in their own homes. And so when he fell, they all went and swam in his palaces and, and looted everything. But the horrors of the war became unveiled. Of course, there were mass graves around the country, and we went there. And it was one of the few times where I really couldn't even take a picture for so long because I couldn't figure out how to take a picture that would actually illustrate the gravity of the situation and how sad it was, how emotional it was. And what you're looking at here in each one of these white sheets is the body of someone. And the families had never had a chance to grieve, so they would come and try and identify their loved ones through sort of shards of clothing and whatever remained. And then I went down to Basra, and because of the looting that was going on around the country, there were fires burning all over Iraq. Uh, looting often caused fires, and so this woman uh, was looking for her husband who was working in a factory where there was a fire, and I remember she was walking directly toward the fire, and I kept saying, are you sure you want to go there? There could be secondary explosions, and she turned around and looked at me like I was insane, and she said, my husband's in there, and she just walked off. And there were protests shortly after the fall of Saddam because people were really frustrated. There was no water, no electricity. They couldn't get money out of the banks. And so they started protesting against the American military. And so I wanted to see what the American military thought. And I started doing my first embeds with the military. Uh, this is in the Sunni Triangle near Baghdad. And I would go uh, in the middle of the night and go with the troops. and photograph and they were pretty open if you got permission to actually be with the military we were able to photograph um, the only restrictions really that I faced was on when someone was killed in action uh, so all scenes like this were pretty routine and we would be with them while they rounded men up in the middle of the night and put bags on their heads and zip ties on their wrists and we were able to photograph that and of course, the great privilege at that time as a journalist is that you can photograph different sides of a story. So this is the Mahdi army, and so we went into Sutter City and, at night and photographed the militias uh, right outside of Baghdad. And in 2004, this is the story that Emery was talking about, that um, Life magazine called me and they said, we have a really great story for you. It's to cover the wounded coming out of Fallujah. And at this point, I still hadn't seen wounded American soldiers. It was something that um, in Baghdad, if there was an explosion, a roadside explosion, if I stopped to cover it, I often had American guns turned on me. At one point, I had soldiers tell me, uh, swear at me and say, you know, 
I guess I can't really say it in this room, but they <laughs> you know, turn their gun on me and say, get out of here. And so I was a bit skeptical about whether we would get access or not. And um, the writer's father and grandfather were both medics in the military. And so they said, you would have pretty good access. So we went in and we went to Balad, which was the closest air base, uh, big air base near Fallujah. And this is one of the first scenes we saw. And it's under infrared light because we were under attack. And it was the inside of a cargo aircraft, a C-17. And basically, there were so many wounded coming out of Fallujah every single day that they literally cleared the aircraft and put the wounded soldiers on the floor of the aircraft in the sides. And this is a young man who was injured and in fighting. And this is how he was being flown to Ramstein, to Germany, for treatment, which was shocking to me. I had never seen anything like this. So I saw these scenes and I photographed them. I was on the ground for about five days. And then we flew to Germany with the wounded and then flew back to the States with the wounded. And I got back. And this was uh, November, about November 5th to the 13th, because I spent one of my birthdays there, I think my 31st birthday. And I got back and I was so excited to send the pictures to Life magazine. And I sent them everything. And, and that was. November 13th, 14th, and I never heard anything back until mid-February when I got a message from the photo editor saying, I hate to write you this email, but we will never publish your pictures from Iraq, for, of wounded soldiers from Iraq, because my feeling is the, that the editor-in-chief thinks they're too difficult for the American public to see. And of course, that's when I wrote the email saying, how dare you send me to war if you don't have the guts to publish what I shoot. And Needless to say, I never worked for them again. <laughs> but um, I did call Kathy Ryan at the New York Times Magazine, and she was able to get them in the magazine right after that. But as a freelancer, uh, when I go on assignment, they own those pictures. They have first rights to publish. So until they say they will never publish them, I can't do anything with the pictures. In 2007, I was working with Elizabeth Rubin uh, for the New York Times Magazine. And she wanted to do a story on why there were so many wounded um, why so many civilians were getting killed in Afghanistan if the US military had some of the best technology in the world. And so we asked to go to the heart of the war, which was in the Korangal Valley. And I remember we went to the public affairs officer in Jalalabad, which is where uh, they staged out of. And Elizabeth and I went in and said, you know, we'd like to go to the Korangal Valley. And he sort of looked at us up and down and said, it's not really a place that's fit for women. And we were like, well, why not? And he said, uh, well, there's no place for you to sleep. And there's no place for you to go to the bathroom. And we were like, well, where do the men sleep? And where do the men go to the bathroom? And he sort of got flustered. And he said, OK, just come back tomorrow. And so you know, as, at that point, women were not allowed on the front lines. But there was no rule for journalists. So of course, we went back. And, and he said, OK, you know, the commander has accepted to take you guys on. And so we flew in to Camp Blessing. And um, we watched a battle unfold that night, that first night in the Tactical Operations Center, the talk. And we asked to go to where that battle happened. Because at the end of the battle, the commander made a decision to drop two 500-pound bombs on this village. So we said, can we go to that village? And they flew us to um, the, the base that was the closest, the cop. And so we got there. And this little boy was brought in as we were arriving. And his parents said that he had been injured in the bomb the night before. And we ended up spending two months in the Korangal Valley living on the side of the mountain with these troops. And every day on six, seven hour a day patrols through the mountains, uh, we were under fire often. Very often, this is us in a shelter. Uh, we were under mortar fire. And at the end of the mission, we were sent on Operation Rock Avalanche, which was a battalion-wide operation. Uh, we literally were airlifted onto the side of the mountain into the heart of Taliban territory. It was where the troops had not gone. We had to jump out of Blackhawks in the middle of the night. Everything was through night vision goggles. And we had to walk for six days with everything on our backs, uh, food, water, warm clothing, uh, sleeping gear, camera gear, everything. And right after we jumped out of the helicopters, we got word that the Taliban was close by. And so we stopped. And for all the photographers in the room, we, we all know that there is nothing more frustrating than being in this situation and not having anything to photograph, because it's pitch black and you can't see anything. But you know that, you're, that there's a huge battle that's about to take place. And so I fell asleep 
I had my flak jacket helmet. I'm sitting on the side of the mountain, and I fell asleep. My camera's around my neck. And suddenly I hear, Adario, wake up. We're sparkling. So I put on my night vision and put my camera. And this is what I saw. And so what you're looking at is a JTAC who works with the Air Force. And he's literally sparkling a target for the AC-130 aircraft to drop the bomb. And so it helps literally walk the attack aircraft onto a target. And he, this laser is visible only through night vision goggles. So the military can only see them. And so I took this picture and then I fell back asleep. And this is where we slept for the first three nights of the operation. And we were all spooning. There were 11 of us. And it was so cold. It was October at about 7,000 feet. And then on the sixth day, we were ambushed. We were hit from three sides. And there were three soldiers who were shot. These are two of the wounded. And S Sergeant Rugel was killed. And this is uh, them carrying his body to the medevac. A year later, uh, I got a call from Dexter Filkins, who was working for the New York Times Magazine, to go directly uh, to the other side of the border to photograph the Taliban in Pakistan. And Dexter went ahead, and he set up the contacts. And he said, I'll call you when I get close, when I think we're going to get permission. And he called, and he said, OK, I think we're good. I flew in. I went to Peshawar. And the night before we're supposed to leave to meet Haji Namdar, the Taliban commander, he said, you are very welcome to come, but the one thing you cannot do is bring a woman. So Dexter and I looked at each other, and Halim, our translator, who was quite sympathetic to the Taliban, said, Mr. Dexter, can't you just take Madam Lindsay's camera and take pictures? And we said, no, that's not how it works. And so he was, he, Dexter said, you know, there's no way we're separating. And so he said, OK. And he said, I know, your husband and wife. That's how you, you two can go together. Well, just say your husband and wife, and no Taliban will leave his wife alone in a strange country. So you must come. OK, for husband and wife. So we dress up in local clothing. And it was actually the only time I've ever seen Dexter Filkins not in khaki pants and a white button-down <laughs> shirt in my whole life. And so we went in, and we got to Haji Namdar's compound. And the men go ahead, and I'm sitting in the car, and um, covered head to toe. Uh, not even my face was showing. And, and they go in, and they ask permission to bring Dexter's wife in. So I go in, and it's a very small room uh, about the size to this chair, to the there. And there are about 15 Taliban fighters with their rockets and their Kalashnikovs. And, and so they're all sitting there, and I walk in. It was incredibly awkward, because in that part of the world, of course, women don't leave the house. But it's also a very hospitable part of the world. That's something a lot of people don't ever hear about. And so Dexter starts interviewing Haji Namdar. And, and then he says, you know, hey, Haji Namdar, thank you for welcoming my wife. And, and do you mind if she takes some pictures? She has a camera with her. And they were like, yeah. And I thought, I can't believe he, they really believe that. So I started taking some pictures. And then suddenly, everyone gets very fidgety. And I thought, oh, of course, this is where they kill us. Like, right? We've been here 20 minutes. What are we thinking? We're, in the, we're meeting the Taliban. And so a man, one of the guys comes over, and he says, madam, we would like to serve you tea, but we don't know how you can drink your tea through your veil. <laughs> and so I'm laughing because I'm thinking, I can't believe we're meeting the Taliban and they're stressed about giving me tea. So he said, Madam, please, can you go to the corner of the room and face the wall? You can lift your veil and drink your tea, and then you can come back. And I was like, OK. <laughs> so that's what I did. And then we, they were happy, and we drove around. They wanted to show us the territory that they controlled. And this is uh, right before Malala Yousafzai was shot. Uh, I had heard that the Taliban was clo closing down girls' schools, much like they had done under the Taliban in Afghanistan. So I snuck in as my driver, uh, Razi's wife. I'm always sort of someone, someone's wife. I snuck into Swat Valley, and we went to some secret girls' schools and did this. And here's a man who said he wanted to go kill Americans and fight jihad in Afghanistan. And in 2009, uh, I won a MacArthur Fellowship. And it was the first time that I was given money with no strings attached. And I can actually do stories uh, that I was curious to do that I wanted to do without an assignment. And so I wanted to photograph uh, maternal health and why women die in childbirth. Because at that point, 550,000 women uh, a year were dying in childbirth. And Afghanistan had a very high rate of maternal death. So uh, I was doing a story for on um, women in Afghanistan for National Geographic. 
So uh, I asked them to incorporate that into the story. And so I went into very remote areas of Badakhshan province, which is a remote area of, of Afghanistan. There was one road that went through the province. And I went to hospitals with no electricity, to mosques where they would announce clinics for women. And, and I spent about two weeks in very remote areas. And on the way back, I was working with Dr. Ziba, who was an Afghan woman raised in New Zealand. And we saw these two women on the side of the road, and we knew that there was something wrong. Because in Afghanistan, you, in, especially in the provinces, you rarely see women who are not accompanied by a man. And so we stopped the car and ran up the, the side of the hill to the women. And, and Dr. Ziba said, what's wrong? Why are you here? And it turned out the woman on the right, uh, Nor Nisa, was in labor. And her water had just broken. And her husband's first wife died in childbirth. And he was so determined to not lose Nornisa that he borrowed a car or rented a car. And he was taking her to the hospital. And the car broke down. So I said, well, just get in my car. I'll take you to the hospital. And they said, we can't. We need permission from her husband. And so I looked at Ziba, and I said, go find the husband. And luckily, there was one road in the whole, in the whole province. So she found him very quickly. She took our car, and she found him. And I took the family to the hospital. And everyone asked me if I photographed the birth and what else I shot. And I actually only shot about three frames of this entire scene, because I knew at the moment I took them to the hospital, I really changed the story, that they probably would not have made it. And so I made a decision not to shoot anymore. Now, there are stories where I do continue shooting, but I put that in the caption, or I incorporate that in the story. But in this particular case, I felt like this was the picture that I wanted to show. And I show you this picture, because this is what National Geographic ran. <clears throat> and we had a very big fight over this picture because I hated this picture. And they liked it because they thought it was an easy read because of the bedroll. Uh, and they felt it was easier with the gutter, which is where the page cuts in half. And so I show that just to show that it's not always your favorite picture that makes it into a spread. So actually, this picture was never published. And, and then it's only after that it's gotten published a lot. I continue doing that work on maternal health in Sierra Leone, another country with a high rate of women dying in childbirth. And this is in 2010. And I traveled uh, to document some of the clinics. Often a woman has to walk for six to 10 hours when she's in labor. When she gets to a clinic, this is what she sees. <clears throat> this is Mama Cisse. It's at the Mog Baraka Government Hospital. And when I met her, uh, she had been pregnant with twins. She was totally coherent. She was telling me how she had been in school studying. And her father pulled her out of school at 16 so she can get married and have children. And she had delivered the first baby in her village. And the second baby wouldn't come out. And so her sister, who was a midwife at the hospital, sent an ambulance to her, which she had been anticipating in case there were problems. She sent an ambulance to her. But to get to that ambulance, she had to take a canoe across a river get to the ambulance, and take an ambulance six hours on bumpy roads while she was still pregnant with the second baby. And she had the first baby. So she was scared and exhausted by the time I met her, and she was in the hospital. And she finally started to deliver. She started to um, about an hour later. And she delivered the second baby. And it was almost completely unresponsive, because it had been inside her at this point for about 12 hours. And the midwives were pay paying so much attention to the baby that they sort of forgot about Mama Cisse. And so she started bleeding. And of course, I'm not a doctor. I'm a photographer. And I photographed a lot of women giving birth. And I said, you know, I think she's bleeding a lot. And I was actually doing video as well while I'm shooting this. And you can hear my voice saying, I think she's bleeding. And the midwives were just sort of mopping up the blood. and. And they were talking to each other and trying to bring the other baby back to life. And Mama Cisse was losing consciousness. And so at that point, I went to try to find the doctor. I said, isn't there a doctor? And they said, well, they sort of laughed. And they said, there's one doctor for the whole province. I said, well, where is he? And they were like, I don't know. So I went, and I went. And he was in surgery. And I put on scrubs. And I went into the surgical ward. And I said, hey, I think there's a woman dying. And they were like, well, I'm busy, you know, he's like, I'm in surgery. And so I went back and I said, you know, maybe you should take her blood pressure. I don't know. It was 60 over 30. And they picked her up and they carried her to the doctor. And by the time she got there, Mama Cisse died. And this is her sister on the right, who is the midwife, uh, telling her mother that her daughter's just died. And then I went back with the family for the burial. <clears throat> 
So Merck, the pharmaceutical company, at the same time uh, that this story came out, Time Magazine ended up publishing it across eight pages. And um, one, of the, one of the board members at Merck, at Merck, the pharmaceutical company, saw this story. And they were trying to figure out what to do with corporate responsibility. And they decided to put aside $500 million to fight maternal death based on seeing this. So they started Merck for Mothers. Uh, in 2011, I was working on assignment in Iraq for National Geographic when the Arab Spring started. And of course, it was the one time in a decade when Iraq was not a story and Egypt was then a story. And so I missed uh, the whole Arab Spring in Egypt and then uh, many of my call in, in Tunisia as well. And I wanted to go to Libya. So I called the New York Times and I said, um, you know, can I go to Libya? And they said, okay. So I went. First, they sent me to Bahrain. I was in Bahrain for about 48 hours and then got pulled out of Bahrain and went to Egypt and crossed into Libya. And like all the journalists who went into Libya, we crossed in illegally uh, without visas, all the journalists covering the uprising. And we knew that one of the great risks, of course, was running into Gaddafi's uh, soldiers because none of us had visas. And Gaddafi had repeatedly said, journalists are spies. And if you see them, you should execute them. So we were covering uh, the popular uprising in Benghazi and in eastern Libya, and there were these great scenes of euphoria and people celebrating and setting up a parallel government. And like, like Iraq and like Afghanistan, there were fires, and you saw garbage piling up, and all the signs of, of uh, the imminent fall of a government. And then there was a call to arms. And many of the journalists, like myself, who went into Libya didn't anticipate fighting because we thought it would be peaceful like Egypt. And we thought that there wouldn't be fighting and that Gaddafi would just surrender. And so there was a call to arms. And we sort of moved forward with all these doctors, engineers, teachers who sort of threw on green in their closet and went to go fight against Gaddafi's military. None of them were really trained. In fact, most of the journalists had much more combat experience than them. Uh, this is as we're moving toward the front line. But from the minute we got to the front, there was the heaviest combat I had probably ever seen. Uh, the terrain was totally flat. There was nowhere to hide. The guys we were with were inexperienced. Uh, Qaddafi's military, they had gunship, helicopter gunships coming in, mortar rounds, tank fire, sniper fire. Uh, completely outgunned, and often uh, Qaddafi's troops, uh, often the guys that we were with, the rebels, just would stop and pray. They would run away in the middle of a battle, and we were sort of left standing there. But sometimes they took ground and they moved forward, they moved toward the west, and basically the front line just kept shifting from west to east, west to east. And we were obviously coming from the east and going west. This is in Ras Lanouf by an oil refinery. It was a very strategic point along the front line. And often, we would sit there for hours and just wait for the hum of an aircraft. And you knew that a bomb would fall near you, because that's, that's what happened with Qaddafi's troops. You would hear the hum of an aircraft, you'd look up, and then a bomb would literally fall like 200 feet away. And you never knew, if, of course, it, where it would fall. And we stayed for about two weeks working the front line. And at that point, I was ready to pull back. And I called the New York Times. And I said, OK, I'm getting tired. I'm ready to go back. And so uh, I was waiting because uh, my colleague Tyler was staying on the front line. And I didn't want to leave him alone. So the two of us spent the night. And on Mar March 15, 2011, we were in the town of Ajdabia. And we knew that front line was falling. It was pretty clear. Mortar rounds were walking into the position. There were leaflets falling. Civilians were fleeing in mass. Um, but of course, we wanted to stay as long as we possibly could to get the best story. At that point, uh, Anthony Shadid and Steve Farrell came and linked up with us. And the four of us were traveling uh, in two separate cars. That's something that journalists do in case one car breaks down. Um, you have a backup car. But the driver of Anthony and Steve's car, his brother was shot at the front line. So they, he suddenly pulled over in the middle of the battle and dumped all their stuff on the side of the road. So four of us ended up in the back of Muhammad's car. And at that point, you have four journalists, uh, all with different tasks, having four different needs. Everyone, can we go to the hospital? Can we go back to the front line? So we went to the hospital to, to check civilian casualties. Then we went back to the front line. At that point, we started getting calls. Muhammad, our driver, started getting calls saying Gaddafi's troops had entered the city and that we should leave. We did not leave at that point. We stayed on the front line to continue covering the fighting. Finally, when every, there was a consensus to leave, 
Uh, Muhammad got another call saying Gaddafi's troops were definitely in the city and we had to leave. So we started pulling back and eventually we made our way back on the road toward Benghazi. And at that point, uh, we saw in the distance that there were troops. And I said, those are Gaddafi's troops on the front line. And everyone in the car actually laughed and they were like, they're behind us, they're not in front of us. Well, they had flanked the desert. Uh, and cut the road in front of us. So we drove directly into one of Qaddafi's checkpoints. And this is the exact place that we stopped. Uh, our driver, Mohammed, panicked. Everyone was yelling something different. Tyler was saying, don't stop, keep driving. Everyone's screaming. And we stopped the car, and Mohammed jumped out and said, Sahafa, we're journalists. And at that point, uh, the men were all pulled out of the car. And I, as the only woman, it's the second time I've been kidnapped or stopped at a hostile checkpoint. And they always sort of just leave me sitting in the car because no one ever really knows what to do with a woman. And so the men were all pulled out. Muhammad went to the left. Tyler, Anthony, and Steve went out to the right. And I was in the back left. So I sort of just put my head in my lap and sort of prayed it would go away. And then the, the rebels that we had been with started opening fire on that checkpoint. And we were literally in a wall of bullets. And I knew that the car that we were in was not armored and that I had to get out of the car, of course. But I was sort of paralyzed with fear. And I eventually sort of talked myself to crawl across the back seat and jump out where Tyler, Anthony, and Steve were. And I saw them all sort of fighting. They each had one of Gaddafi's troops on them, sort of wrestling with them. And at that point, it was there were bullets everywhere. So we saw this building. We each knew instinctively we had to get behind the building for cover if we were to survive. And I remember getting out of the car, and I started running. And I saw uh, Anthony had tripped and fallen. And he was looking up with such fear in his face. And I'd never seen Anthony scared. And I thought, this is really as bad as it seems. And so we did make it to behind this building. And we were told to lie face down in the dirt, execution style. Uh, we each had a gun put to our heads. And I looked to the right, and we each were just begging for our lives. And I remember my mouth was so dry, I couldn't even get the words out. I just said, please. And then the commander came over and said, you can't kill them. They're American. We don't know why he said that, of course. Um, and so they tied us up uh, and placed us in vehicles on the front line. And from there, for the next three days, we were all beaten. Uh, threatened with execution. Um, for, for me, as the only woman, I was groped repeatedly, uh, while the men were really beaten physically a lot more than I was. And then we were put in prison in CERT and then flown in a military aircraft to Tripoli, where we were held for another three days. Of course, uh, over those three days, they took us several times to, uh, we don't know where, they, blind they blindfolded us and brought us to a government office. And they said they would release us twice and then said, no, the plan's off and brought us back to captivity. So we didn't really know if we'd ever get released. And finally, we were released on the sixth day. And Brian Denton went back about three weeks later to look for Muhammad's body, our driver. He was never found. He was never seen again. And he just found my shoe on the side of the road. Um, but Muhammad was never found. I told my family after that I wouldn't go into Syria, so uh, even though I did go into Syria, I ended up covering the refugee crisis uh, pretty extensively. This is the border with Iraq. So I covered Syrians uh, in all the neighboring countries of Syria. This is Lebanon. Uh, this is a wedding ceremony for a 13-year-old girl. This is her engagement party. So Syrians have always had a tradition of marrying young, but with the war that's been exacerbated because families feel like they can't protect their young women living in such close proximity with other young men that they marry them off earlier. This is at the border of Turkey and Syria. And then I covered ISIS's push uh, into uh, Sinjar Mountains. And so these are families displaced from there into northern Iraq. And a lot of girls have gone missing because they've been held as sex slaves uh, by ISIS. And so this is a family whose sister had gone missing, a family arriving at one of the camps. So last year, uh, Kira Pollack from Time Magazine called me. She's a photo editor. And she said, you know, we need to move the refugee story beyond where we're at. Um, and do something more in depth. And she had this idea of following a woman through pregnancy and childbirth and following a baby for the first year of its life. So she sent me and Aaron Baker to go find that family. And we ended up finding three families. Um, so this is the cover a year ago, over a year ago. 
Um, and we followed, it was a pretty difficult and exhaustive process finding three Syrian women who would agree not only to let us photograph their birth, but to follow them for a year through one of the most difficult times in their lives. It's a lot to ask of someone. So we ended up, there were some families who dropped out, like this woman, Sana. Uh, she dropped out, Suad. This is her finding out she had um, placenta previa, major complications in that she had to have a full hysterectomy and she might die in that surgery. She had no idea, of course, because she had never had prenatal care. And this is her coming out of surgery. This is Taima. Uh, we met Taima, and she. Um, this is her about a week after delivering her baby. She had postpartum depression that was, of course, undiagnosed, but she told us repeatedly she wanted to kill herself, that she didn't want to live anymore, that the camps were too difficult and dirty to raise a child. So we then followed Taima through. Uh, she was moved into a hotel after giving birth, and then she, this is her daughter with pneumonia, and she and her family ended up getting asylum in Estonia. And this is her packing the night before leaving for Estonia. And her and her husband on the plane for asylum. And then they got to Estonia and they drove for three hours and there were no lights on the streets and no people. And they said, where have they sent us? They've sent us to the middle of nowhere. And so she and her husband were so depressed that they were put in this par apartment in the middle of nowhere that they decided to leave Estonia and to go to Germany, where they're now trying to get asylum all over again and starting the process. But this is the first year, first birthday of their baby, Helen, who was on the cover of Time. And these are just a few on assignment pictures, just to show you. Uh, it's Fallujah crossing illegally into Darfur. Darfur, Afghanistan. That's me, the little one on the left. <laughs> That's in 2009, seven months pregnant in Gaza, in Libya, and that's it. Thank you.